This is the Television Enthusiast Podcast, The Weekly Sex. Episode 48, recorded March 17th, 2016. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. Joining me today, as always, is Will Wurig, our master of comics, or keeper of comics. Keeper, master, whatever. Yes. <laughs> My lord uh, and savior. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. <laughs> I am your host for the evening. I am the editor-in-chief of TV, and Th- <laughs> TV Enthusiast. My name is Tyson Gifford. Uh, uh, today we are going to be doing the 48th episode of the weekly set where we are going to be talking about the magicians uh, 11 uh a little bit about uh, crazy ex-girlfriend and some other shows that i'm just going to kind of quickly touch base on like baskets and flight um new shows this season that i'm just going to kind of talk about real quick impression uh and that's going to be it for the podcast so let's start things off uh with the magicians so, man, what a kind of crazy, amazing episode we had here at the Magician. Yeah, this was this was pretty nuts. It was actually pretty interesting too because this was like they they went to the house of like the author of the Fillory book to yes, get Christopher Plover to to get clue to get clues about Fillory and you know where to go. Well, well, first of all, what happens is Quentin realizes that Penny stole the manuscript for the sixth Fillory book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which uh, and and Penny, uh, Pe- Penny apparently took the time to read it before throwing it throwing it out, which is actually surprising because Penny, <laughs> he, has, he has no interest in that stuff, so it's surprising he took the time to read it. But he did, and and to Quentin's relief, like Penny actually remembers details about what he read, and so basically what happens is Penny read that there's a button that is a key to Fillory, and that and they quickly figure out that that button is still in the author's old house somewhere. What's hilarious about it is that when Penny kept recalling it, he kept changing it. Like it was a talking animal guardian that uh, um, yeah, it was that a he took it from. And he kept going like, it was like a dog. No, wait, it was a badger. No, wait. <laughs> yeah, it was a pig. No, wait. Yeah, he kept a badger. showing it change. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> Seeing those kind of like, you know, like talking cute little animals with fillery it's just it's always like this weird off-putting thing with kind of like the dark nature of the magician yeah it, it is pretty dark like it is pretty off-putting and then you re- <laughs> and then you remember like the fillery novels are supposed to be like kind of children's novels so uh-huh. it's going to have like so naturally anything written about fillery is going to have the that kind of cutesy like flair to it what we found out in this episode though is that fillery doesn't actually it seemed before like maybe fillery was this dark place and we were getting this kind of more lighthearted take on it and now we're kind of seeing that it's actually an element not from Fillory that is turning Fillory into this dark place. Right. Uh, we have this kind of idea of now and that maybe it was all happy and fuzzy before. It seemed like Jane Chapman loved jumping back and forth to Fillory so um, it, she didn't have hesitation about it as a child so maybe there wasn't an issue at hand with Fillory beforehand but what this episode was about was showing how darkness came to Fillory or like what the darkness is that comes to Fillory. Um, and in doing so, they gave us the identity of the beast. Uh, they, you know, the, uh, the kind of what's going on with the Chatwins and what was happening with the author of the book series. It, it was kind of like rapid fire details that, you know, like new, new information that just kind of dropped on us like bombshells, like rapid fire. Yeah, it was pretty rapid fire. Yeah, it was like Pick, picking up from last, the last step episode where we also had those kind of quick realizations like oh you know like Eliza is is Jane Chatwin wow okay now she's dead dead. (laughs) so Eliza was Jane Chatwin um we found out that she actually wrote the sixth book herself Mm -hmm. um and then and then we find we find out all these details about the backstory of like the author and like uh you know and stuff so we find out that the main story is the main thing the biggest reveal in this episode so is we find out that the author of the Fillory book is actually or may actually be because it's not like confirmed. It's not explicit, but it's pretty it's pretty it, heavily it's not it's not confirmed, it's like heavily inferred. But yeah. it could 
I mean, there's also room for it to be misdirection, so we can't like say 100. percent But it's heavily yeah, yeah. it's heavily inferred that the author of the Fillory books is actually the Beast, the main antagonist of the series, because he mm-hmm. talks about because they see through these ghosts, which are actually re, which are actually like these ghosts are kind of replaying events that happened in the past. Um, Very supernatural, like um, yeah. supernatural has done that before. We have these ghosts that are kind of repeating these the moment before their death or something. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so they, they, it's kind of a lot like that. And and uh, uh, you know, Sarah Gamble's the showrunner on the Magicians, and she wrote on Supernatural, so it makes sense. Uh, they kind of used a ghost story as like the framing device for the whole story, as like a way of of getting all this information out. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They use this as a framing to get all this information out because they're it's pretty clever because it is a lot of information to have to put out there. And since they're on the ninth episode out of like. 14 it's like they gotta fight they had to find a way to get this information out there in like a condensed form and i think this worked really well for that because mm-hmm. it was also it was creepy and it was it was creepy it was well executed but we find out that the author knowing that fillory is a real place because jane had jane and the children went there and they're pretty open about their experiences we know that the author wrote these books he knows fillory is real so knowing that he began studying magic and he talks about having to grow a six finger you know or extra fingers to do some spells because in the magicians the magic Magic is all done through like finger movements. It's actually um, when I had the opportunity to do like a conference call with the showrunner and um, the star, the actor who plays Quentin on the series, they said they copied it from uh, a form of like hip hop dancing called finger tutting, which is where they kind of do like these kind of weird movements with their fingers and stuff. And that's kind of the inspiration behind the way they presented that in the um, in the show version. In the books, it was just kind of like finger movements kind of that that's how the spells are done instead of like you know uh uh, you know a wand shake and and like a spell being said out loud or something or like some kind of weird chant all the magic is done by these kind of like hand gestures and finger moves oh yeah oh that's interesting yeah that's cool that you uh, found that out like you actually got to talk to them yeah yeah. information um yeah yeah that's cool yeah like all the spells are like finger movements it's kind of cool i heard like the idea behind magic in the magicians is like it's like high level mathematics you know like very high level mathematics Mm -hmm. that's the basic idea behind magic um but the point is you know we 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 find out that he's been studying magic as as a means to you know like he like he actually plans to go to fillory himself and and through this it's inferred that oh crap this is actually the beast like yeah. the author of the books is actually the beast because if he's been studying, talking about growing yeah six finger which is the beast has six fingers on each hand the six, beast has six fingers he's been talking about growing a six finger um he's talking about going to fillory you know and so Quentin comes to realize it because because the biggest like the most jarring thing was and Quentin pointed this out was in all the fillory novels previously there was no such thing as the beast the beast didn't exist yeah quentin could not reconcile this with anything that he's read you know and it kind of like and then uh it kind of ties into the previous episode where like you know quentin upon learning that the beast may be from fillory and that fillory's he gets the idea that fillory wasn't all that he thought it was and he had he, he had a pre, he had a crisis over over the idea that everything he thought about fillory was wrong Mm-hmm. And now this kind of turns that on his head where, oh, snap, the beast actually isn't from Fillory at all. It's an invading, like, figure, you know? Um, so that kind of that kind of turns turns everything on its head again. Which is something I really like because I really dislike it in, in shows or movies when the main villain or something is just kind of like this evil force or something without thought. Right. And the idea that, like, oh, it's just like it's this evil of Fillory or something was never all that interesting to me. I mean, right. I always thought the character was really creepy, but just like the kind of, you know, the idea that he could just be this evil force that's always been there in Fillory wasn't really all that entertaining to me. I'm really much more of a fan of like when you get kind of like the origins of evil, kind of like the idea of like the things that make this person who they are, how they came into being power and how they became what they are now. And that's what this episode did. Right. This episode, I mean, well, we didn't see what made... We didn't 
didn't you know, see pl- Plover yeah. Evil to begin with, or Plover Evil to begin with, because by the time the episode started, which we don't know until towards the end of the episode, Plover's already a fucking child molester. Well, he, yeah, he's a child molester. He's a pedophile. That doesn't that doesn't necessarily make you want to take over magical realms and like murder yeah. people. Um, <laughs> but we got himself. to see kind of this element of him, which is what makes right. it even creepier is the idea that um, Fillory as being like this, you know, it's these children books and kids love them and it's all these kind of adventure. And the idea that the thing that invades that is a child molester yeah, is like crazy. super creepy, you know? <laughs> it just is this whole other layer. It's almost as if Fillory is like the world of our dreams, is, is like the world of children's dream. And yeah. now a child molester alert. The, ul- the ultimate kind of boogeyman, you know? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. So, so yeah, it's it's just kind of really awesomely done. Um, and we find out that he's a child molester because we we find out this there, there this this hint towards the idea that um Martin Chatwin Jane's brother uh isn't able to get into Fillory anymore. And yeah. at first, I was kind of thinking maybe Martin's going to be the one that ends up being the beast, like the way they're playing it out, you know? Because yeah. I'm like, oh, he has some darkness that's keeping him out I of Fillory. Yeah, he's I getting like... jealous of Jane. You know, all these. I'm kind of like, is this where this is going yeah but that's kind of cliche um so but, it, but that's it almost it. seemed like they were they were placing the red herring for that you know right right and then what we find out is what what's in all likelihood it's the fact that he's being molested that's causing this darkness that's not l- allowing him to get in it's like he's the things the emotions that are going through his head because of what's happening to him are likely the root of what's making it so he can't get to fillory right so and can... yeah so jane goes to fillory and this is what you know the the event that's written in the sixth book, which brings Quentin um, to the to this house that, that they go where they go. Uh, the entire like plot device that moves them there is that Jane goes to Fillory and basically catches one of these kind of spirit animals or whatever of the of the la- mag- magical land and forces it to give an item, which ends up being a button that would allow you to to directly transport to Fillory, which is she's getting for Martin because she can already get to Fillory just by going through the closet, but he can't anymore, so she's trying to get this for him, and at first we think like, oh, you know, this is like, so Martin desperately wants this, you know, he's she's she's getting it for him, and you kind of don't understand the reasoning, but when he gets the button, when, when she gives him the button, he very quickly hands it off to one of the other kids in the house, because there's other two other children in the house, um, Beatrice and George, and he quickly hands the button off to George, and tells George to hide it, and you're like, well, why? I mean, this is what he's been wanting this whole time. And it's the thing is because he realizes the worst possible thing that can happen is if Plover gets into Fillory. Right, right, exactly. And so it's not, getting the Fillory isn't all there is for uh, uh, for Christopher. It, it's the idea of, uh, um, or not Christopher, for Martin, it's the idea of like getting away from Plover. And um, so yeah, he doesn't want to give Plover the keys to the kingdom, essentially. So he's kind of scared when um, um, Jane ends up giving him this button, gives it to George. Um, that's why it was never found because George was basically murdered by the uh, by Plover's yeah, sister. Like Plover's a sadistic, like psycho sister who like yeah. to torture children. Apparently, and it was placed in the quiet room. How which is, quiet room. <laughs> yeah, which is like this. Yeah, basically the torture chamber for these kids. And of course, so nobody found it because it's this hidden off room that knew, nobody knew how to get to and so it's been there this whole time because she moved his body George's body there so it's just basically been in his pocket this whole time this key to Fillory yeah. um, we also see the other uh, child that lived there which was uh, um, Beatrice also killed by being poisoned yeah by being poisoned yep <laughs> so it's it's oof, just a myriad of fucked up situations one after another uh, they end up finding a way to get um, this button. They, they need to get into the quiet place, but the, the ghost of uh, of Plover's sister kind of stands in the way. So Quentin figures out something and he runs into the house. He goes into the writing room and he finds all of these like naked pictures of Martin and maybe other children for all we know 
that Plover's been ta- took and hid in this book and, and scattered them all around the house. And this is a house that has like these tours constantly during the day and the ghosts apparently only really have power at night. So it's go, it would expose her brother as, as being this pedophile. Um, so she goes and rushes to the, to the house to kind of gather all those things. And that gives them the time to get into the quiet room and recover the item. Right. Um, on the way to leaving the house though, there is a confrontation between Elliot and uh, Alice because Alice is basically like desperate to like, you know, how can we give these children peace? How can we solve the situation? Elliot and Penny and, and Quentin are all like, you can't. Yeah, there, like, there is nothing we can do. We can put the house to rest, but we can't put their spirits to rest. Like Elliot, Elliot, like uh, call, calls her, you know, says like it's the ultimate form of like egotism to think that she could just like fix it. And- Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he basically like he's he, he's grieving over what he had grieving. to do. Yeah, he's grieving over what he has to do, and he like he just like ooh, ethers her pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of Alice reluctantly leaves with Quentin because it's like there's there's just nothing they can do. So they take off, and they're back at their place, and the button's sitting on the table, and Penny goes out to touch it, and Quentin's like, "Oh, hold on, don't touch it yet," and Penny's like. Dude, Dude, I trained under these travelers. I'm cool. I'm not going anywhere unless I want to. Touches the button and boop, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> and the episode ends with Quentin's line. Told him not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good episode. I definitely enjoyed that. Looking forward to the next episode even more now because of Oh that. yeah, definitely. Penny and Fillery. Yeah, Penny and Fillery. We yes. And he's yes. like the perso- perfect person to see in Fillery too, because he's the one that just thinks it's all so stupid. I know. <laughs> so he's going to see like these little magical things and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my God. He's going to be like, oh, it, this is going to be, that's going to be a thing of beauty. I, I love Penny so much in this show. He's yeah. such a big, I, I like the line at the beginning when Quentin's like confronting Penny about the manuscript and then, and then like Penny's like being a sarcastic ass and then Quentin's like, dude, you can't possibly want to be a dick more than you want to live. Yeah, it was really funny. Um, I one of my favorite moments was uh, the tour guide, and so Quentin, when they go to this house at first, before they find out that the author was like this raging pedophile and everything, uh, they're on this tour, and Quentin keeps interrupting the tour guide, yeah. and he's totally fangirling on the whole thing. He's taking like selfies of like him in the writing room. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he took like yeah the selfie. He and he and he and he even he even made like that stupid grin that people make when they're like doing that too like yeah <laughs> and, it's like... and yeah and he was interrupting the tour guide and everything like that and then later on when they're investigating the place the tour guide kind of gets in their way and you realize oh he knows kind of what's going on because he's scared to death of the ghosts that are going to come out and he starts kind of giving them some information after Elliot displays some magic to kind of scare him um, and then gets popped out and then they find his body with his mouth stitched shut <laughs> yeah. Uh, which instantly, first thing popped in my mind is, oh, snitches get stitches. <laughs> yeah, snitches get stitches. Just, they just said that line without a character saying it. That was great. Um, but yeah, so that was cool. What else happened in this episode? Because this was a monumental episode. We also had um, the side story of Quentin's friend. Um, okay, I can't remember her name. I didn't even put it in the show note. Where she was going into the mind of a, um, a, 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 of, of a, a, a magician who'd gotten caught who'd gone comatose basically because of the magic she had and is oh, yeah, uh, yeah. through through her her doctor magician friend who graduated break bills um she goes with this uh this girl and she transcribes this information or gets basically reads this like dream version of this girl's like formulas for her magic and memorizes it so she can bring it out to the world it's kind of like her last wish um she's able to do that and then uh the final request from the girl who's trapped in this world is is to be killed. And so I actually thought that was kind of beautifully done the way it was like uh 
it was like stage lights going out, you know? Right. It's like all the kind of darkness like shrinking in, like the light kind of shrinking out of the uh, uh, this dream area she was in, this kind of like uh, park. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and that was, we still don't know what that formula is and what significance that is besides just this bond between this one um, therapist, break bills magician, and, uh, and the character. We don't know where that's going, if that's going to take some weird dark turn or what's going on there. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on with that. We'll just have to see what happens with that. Yeah, that we, there's, there's not much else to talk about with that storyline. The big thing was, of course, all this stuff about <laughs> the writing of Fillory and further and all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah really well. good episode. Um, yeah, it just Magicians continues to kill it. These last two episodes have been just stunning. So I just cannot wait. Uh, Penny and Fillory next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's move on. Let's talk about uh, 112263. Now, I forgot we were actually supposed to be talking about two episodes of this, right? I only got, I only wrote down notes for the most recent. Yeah, you only worked on notes for the most recent, but if you just want to talk about that one, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. If, if we get any other details that go back into there, you know, in our discussion, they'll come up, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but this was actually like, this was actually like a pretty creepy episode. Um, this is this- actually directed by James Franco, this episode. Oh really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, this this is the episode where where they where this is the night where Lee Harvey Oswald decides to uh, take take the shot at General Walker. Of course, he only manages to wound General Walker, but 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 they're daring up. They're very keen to witness this and see if Lee Harvey Oswald is the one who takes the shot, or if he acts alone, or you know, so they can figure out, you know, if Lee Harvey Oswald go goes goes alone and takes a shot then they know that he is the Kennedy's then he is the sole killer of Kennedy and they can take him out and you know and James Franco could return to the future otherwise yeah otherwise it would be pointless if they just killed him to see you know what would happen and and it didn't turn out that he was acting alone then Kennedy would still die and it wouldn't matter and that wouldn't matter so this is a pretty this is a pretty big moment so they're gearing up for that but it doesn't work out as planned yeah because uh Jake's girl friend Sadie her uh, husband uh, is in town um, trying to kind of get her back even though she doesn't want to be with him and they're trying to get divorced she ends up telling Jake this kind of fucked up story about him having like a clothespin on his penis or <laughs> just weird ass shit. I, I don't know I was, I was trying to like said there was like a clothespin and I'm like what I don't, I don't even what yeah. I have no clue <laughs> I, yeah. it's just that's like our first sign that this guy's got problems you know uh and then jake kind of puts him out like like you know stay away you know you're not gonna get near her again i know what kind of a sick freak you are all this kind of stuff and then um that kind of backfires on him on the eve of uh this event that's supposed to happen with lee harvey oswald he suddenly receives a phone call uh from the husband basically saying you know that he's got the his wife there and that jake better come there right right jake so, better come. so he gets jake to the, the house and she's got a bag over her head they take the bag off he's he's cut up her face um and he's basically telling he's got them both at gunpoint and he's telling them he's telling jake to drink this like i don't know it's, chemical, it's like bleach yeah it's bleach yeah it's, it's it's bleach he explains that he's he's a salesman and he and he goes around selling that brand of bleach and he brags about you know he, he brags about how good he is at selling it to Jake mm-hmm. and then tries to get Jake to drink it. Um, of course, it doesn't does go well. And Jake uh, ends up throwing it in his face. Like, and, and, I, and I was thinking of that point. I'm thinking, what did you honestly, did you honestly think he was just going to drink it because you were holding a gun to him? You handed him a glass of bleach. All he had to do was throw it in your face and you're blind. <laughs> and you can't but, but if he did it right shit. away, you know, <laughs> yeah. they needed the distraction. And they Needed, yeah, they needed the distraction. Because <laughs> otherwise, he would have thrown the bleach in his face, and he would have killed her right away. You know, like before right. he hit him. But uh, they got their distraction. They threw the bleach in his eyes, and Jake hit him with a uh, um, what are those things called? Those uh, the sticks that you have by a fireplace. <laughs> those big metal things with the hooks on the end. You know, whack.
whacks the husband in the head with that, embedding it in his head. <laughs> and then he drops his gun. Sadie picks it up and shoots him. And so husband taken out. But over in Lee Harvey Oswald world, uh, you know, we have a uh, uh, Bill is trying to, he has to be the one to identify um, if Lee Harvey Oswald shooting alone, he gets a vision of his sister uh, leaving the building that this is happening at. And so he chases after her. It turns out not to be a sister. It's just he had this kind of hallucination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This hallucination was successfully distracted him from seeing who shot General Walker. And so it's like, so that that was actually like time, like, you know, trying to prevent itself from being chained. Mm-hmm. So that's that's uh, what happened there. Uh, this is, yeah, time pushing back. Probably related to kind of all the events that happened in this episode. The, the husband and everything else is kind of the machinations of time in this, which is kind of almost like death in Final Destination. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's basically it's basically death. Bill falls for it. Uh, Jake finds out. Jake is incredibly pissed that he missed it. Um, and then Jake, Jake fully opens up to Sadie. He tells her the truth about who he is and where he came from. Mm-hmm. And at first she like laughs, thinking he's joking, but then she realizes he's serious. And then she like, I don't know, kind of accepts it. <laughs> it as far as we know, she accepts it. It could just be you know, waiting for him to leave, and then he, she's going to be like, okay, get to somebody in here. This guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's crazy. I know, right? No. <laughs> she seems to accept it, though. She seems to accept it in this episode. And so I guess that's the way the episode ends. Uh, it was pretty tense. Uh, who, who knew her, ex, her ex-husband was such a psychopath, like literally a psychopath? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. This is, this is uh, our two main topics here with the magicians in 11 63 are all about these crazy people tied to these people's past you know in their lives yeah I know. <laughs> oh it's all about the crazies tonight <laughs> yeah. but that was 11 63 so we have to wait to see what's coming up next week um there one thing i can say is that they are in 63 now i believe yeah. they are in 1963 so i mean yeah. when he traveled back it was 1960 so he's been there for three years now basically yeah he's in 1963 well it's wrapping up because it's an eight episode series and this was episode five and yeah so-, so it's it's close um to to everything going down i wonder if they're going to do a second season of this if they're gonna like have everything kind of not work out right and then he goes back and then they're gonna groundhog stay it i don't know yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with this. I'm excited. I feel like they're going to Groundhog Day it in some way or another. Like, if this is a limited series and it ends after eight episodes, I feel like it's not going to go right initially, and then they're going to do an episode that kind of, like, jumps back through all these kind of events that already happened, but play out a little bit differently, and kind of show his progress in, like, a Groundhog Day-esque way. Like, you know, like, Groundhog Day had that moment in the movie where, like, you see him, like, doing, like, he re- reaches a certain point where he just doesn't care anymore, and he just starts doing messed up stuff left and right and it's it's almost like a montage of all these different days he's had where he's just tried random weird shit because he was bored um before he got back on track and i almost have a feeling like if if they don't groundhog stay the whole thing for like another season that they're going to do like an episode like that at some point where they're going to show like that he's gone through this over and over again and you know had issues and where he was able to succeed and not and where maybe he forgot something one time and you know what what happened with that but we'll have to see i have a feeling he's going to go back because they've made these big points already about like the one the kid that wanted to join the army that that died in the fire that w- when time was pushing back and things like that that they made a big deal pointing out or like um when sadie mentions that she was when he first started his journey in 1960 that she was in like the same town as him. right so right. he could have met her like way earlier they made a big deal about that so i have a feeling that they're going to he's going to have to repeat it. I mean, they've given too many clues to that, that, that he's going to have to go through this again, that it's not going to work in one go. Um, so yeah, I'm I, I'm kind of interested to see how that works out. There's only three episodes left. Yep, pretty much. I'm pretty interested in that. So let's move on. Let's talk about um, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Now, this is a show I don't watch. This is a show I do want to watch. <laughs> but as we've talked about many times, this is one of those issues where you know, they you can only get the most, like the foremost recent episodes on 
Hulu or any other, even the official website for the channel, they don't have all of them up. So I'm, I'm stuck until it hits like Netflix or hits Hulu again with the full season. I'm stuck and can't watch it. But Will has been watching it. You're caught up on it, right? Yes, I'm caught up. Well, no, I'm not caught up. I just watched the second episode. I just watched, uh, the episode where blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rebecca sends Josh the, Re- Rebecca sends the wrong text to Josh. So basically, okay. so basically, Rebecca had just had just had like a coming out of sort where she admitted to her best friend Paula that she is totally in love with Josh Chan and that she she moved she moved there specifically for him and everything and so and so what happens at the beginning of the episode is that they 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 they're at work and they're like in this meeting and stuff and Rebecca like and Rebecca at her friend uh, Paula's urging writes writes this detailed text about how she's totally in love with Josh. Josh and that how she's totally in love with Josh and that it was such a good idea for her to move there because of him and that they're going to get married and shit and she clicks send and then her and then her friend is like I didn't get the text and she looked and she sent it to Josh (laughs) (laughs) which which leads to this huge scramble where she she realizes that she quickly realizes that Josh is somewhere else and that he left his phone at phone at his apartment so all she has do is get to his apartment and, he, and delete the text from his phone before he sees it. She breaks in to his apartment, deletes text, but he catches her inside of his apartment and that leads to she has to explain why she's there and she comes up with the story that her place was broken into and she was scared and she got in, in there and everything. And so Josh, and this just escalates more from here. Josh, Josh gets protective. He takes her back to her apartment um but before that she told josh like uh like somebody threw a rock through her window and so and so she calls up her best friend paula um to go and throw a rock through her window before they get there (laughs) and uh Oh, and there's like this other subplot about Paula and her husband. Their marriage was on the, their marriage was in trouble. So they went to see a marriage counselor and he told them they had to have a day together. And she was going to go by herself and do this, but her husband insisted on going with her. <laughs> <laughs> so she kind of takes him along, but she says, you know, you can come along, but no quest. Don't ask any <laughs> questions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, her husband is actually the person who throws the rock through the window <laughs> because she tells him to look for a rock and then, and then she's going to throw it but he's like no no let me I want to do it <laughs> so, and, and so they break it so uh, Rebecca gets back to the apartment with Josh and all the glass and everything and then they're having a moment and it seems like it seems like everything worked out well except Josh called the police <laughs> And so the cop comes over and Rebecca convinces the cop to leave by by pointing out that nothing seemed to have been stolen and nobody was hurt. The only thing that happened was a window was broken, so so it was really like a nonviolent crime, more like a misdemeanor. And so she gets the cop to leave by convincing him that it's not really that important to investigate. And and then finally she has her moment with Josh and she orders fondue when Josh picks up the rock that broke through the window and that's when and then that's when he realizes that the rock came from inside the house because Rebecca has like this decorative set of rocks that say like you know something like home sweet home or something on each of the rocks and the one in the middle is missing and that's what Paula's husband used to break the window (laughs) so basically Josh looks at that and realizes that the rock came from inside the house and then he slowly realizes is Rebecca had been lying about the whole incident <laughs> and he feels like weirded out and shit and they, if like, he only knew <laughs> yeah, if he only, yeah if he only knew yeah he feels like very weirded out and he just like leaves <laughs> leaving her to like feel like absolute shit 
Yeah. So that's Crazy Ex Girlfriend. That's where you've watched so far. That's where I've watched so far. How many how many episodes are left in the season? I think there's like about five episodes. No, like probably about four more episodes hmm. left for me to watch. So this might be something that I'll be able to watch next year before the next season starts. Yeah. Hopefully they get it up on Netflix or something else it, quick enough to give me time to catch up before it starts. Because <laughs> um, I'd like to talk to you about this, but I've only seen the pilot. Okay, yeah. You have to, you have to check it out. So I've been watching a few of the new shows this season. I kind of wanted to catch up on some of them. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about some of the comedies this time. Um, I've been watching Baskets on FX. This is the Zach Galifianakis clown show from uh, Louis C.K. produces the show. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. It's interesting. It's the weirdest thing is probably that Zach Galifianakis's mother, like his character's mother, is being played by Louis Anderson in drag. <laughs> oh my god, seriously? Yeah, Louis, so that, that's kind of weird. Louis Anderson God, I hadn't heard of him in like forever. Yeah. That's random. <laughs> He's really good in it though. Like really believable as this kind of like mom that's got all her own issues going on. But um, he also plays himself and his twin. So he's he's like twin brothers in that. There's the one that's the clown that's the main character. That's Chip. And then there's his twin brother, Dale, who's like runs this like school. It's like a vocational school. <laughs> Chip and Dale. Yeah. <laughs> but he runs like a vocational school like where they teach like uh you, you know like when you see those commercials that say like you know uh engineering air conditioner repair or get your degree you know <laughs> oh, yep, yep. i remember those commercials he's, he's running one of those kind of schools and he's oh, got geez. you know his family and so um very different types of characters uh and it, it, what's interesting about the show is it's like it's kind of like not funny and then it is funny but like in kind of moments you don't expect which is what's like interesting about the show because it's like louie in the van that like it's kind of tragic and it's really messed up and you feel really bad for the characters and you know the characters are all kind of stupid and doing dumb things and you're kind of like uh you know but at the same time certain things they do just make you like bust up laughing uh like just how dense they are about one certain thing you know like they're like uh, uh zach gimanekis character he has this friend that's kind of in his life it's like this insurance adjuster because his car is um is, like stolen or something i can't even remember what happened it was like in the first episode and so this insurance adjuster comes out this woman and he ends up kind of becoming friends with her kind of it's like weird like he just calls her when he needs like to get a ride somewhere or something and she's very meek and she's always kind of like you know trying to talk to him about something and he'll he just kind of like goes like yeah whatever nobody cares what you think <laughs> and he's like really mean to her and it's kind of tragic and sad and um but it's really funny in this that weird way so that's it's a pretty interesting show if you're into kind of the very non-traditional comedies. Comedies that aren't necessarily always funny. Um, Baskets is actually pretty good. Um, then I've been watching uh, Flaked on Netflix. This is uh, one of the two new shows that debuted um, this season. I've seen, I think, four or five episodes maybe of it. Um, Will Arnett's in this one. He plays a guy who's like a self-help guru who killed a man um, because he was drunk driving and now he kind of runs like a, um, like, how, how do you say uh, uh he, he, he's kind of leading the meetings for like you know a, like an aa type thing and he's in, so he's involved in that and he gets kind of involved in all these people's lives that are connected to that program and when i say he's like kind of a self-help guru it, it's almost like it's more like he wants to be like he kind of thinks in this kind of motivational way and he's trying to help the people that he's close to it's not that he's actually like making money on that or doing that you know it's like he's just trying to be a, a, a guru like a better person because he feels guilt for having you know killed a man in his past and it's just kind of about him and his friends and um kind of what's going on with that and it's it's just it's pretty funny pretty light-hearted considering the backstory um and just yeah you care about the characters and they're all interesting and it's good uh cool. and then i watched cool. and then i watched the characters on netflix so i saw the first about episode and a half of the show before i'm just like okay i'm done <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is this is one like that, that we can, then, huh? yeah uh we we had we expected this not to be that good when we talked about it in our spring preview um this is the one that's about it it's basically each episode is like a self-contained pilot for the sitcom of like that character but there's there's too much format to it there's like this idea that 
all of the people end up playing multiple characters in their one episode. And it's like, so it's not like these are like eight separate pilots. These are like, they all fit in the same kind of format, but they're these completely different. It's weird. It's, it's almost like, like a weird sketch thing you'd see, like a really low budget sketch thing you'd see on Comedy Central. They'd be like intercut with like uh stand up comedy or something from somebody you've never heard of. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? There's like little yeah. bits they'd show at like 1 a.m. or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. They're yeah. kind of like, you kind of watch and you're like, why am I watching it? This isn't that good or something. <laughs> that's, that's like what the characters is, basically. Um, there's way too much format to it. For comedy, it takes itself too seriously and not in a, it takes itself seriously to be funny, but like in a takes itself seriously in otherwise way that it just does not work. The first episode was pretty miserable. I got through that. Started watching the second episode, did not crack a smile once through the whole thing and got about halfway through and just kind of said, Oh, done. Nope, done. I'm not going to watch this anymore. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah the characters is one to skip out on Netflix Flaked is one to check out on Netflix but speaking of Netflix there's only one thing I think most of the people that listen to this podcast or that are interested in this podcast are going to be watching on Netflix in this next week and that is Daredevil which comes out literally for me in two hours <laughs> <laughs> so it hits at midnight Pacific time right now it is uh, 10 o'clock Pacific time where I am uh, and worldwide it hits it at, uh, at midnight Pacific time. So it's not midnight in everybody's separate time zone. Like Will couldn't be watching it right now. He'd have to wait another two hours just like I do. Um, but that's going to hit. So yeah, uh, that's what's coming up in the next week. That's the only thing coming up in the next week. But hey, it's a whole season of Daredevil. Could not be more excited. Uh, and if you're interested in hearing us talk about Daredevil, we're going to be getting together on Sunday for our regular um TVE versus Marvel and D- uh, and DC video. There's no DC in this one though because we're going to be exclusively talking about Daredevil. Uh we're going to try to get through as much as we can. We're going for about half of it. Who knows if we make it that far, you know what's going to happen. TVE versus Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> TVE versus Daredevil. <laughs> uh but yeah, you this is what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. So if you want to check that out, that's on our YouTube channel. Um, as well, you know, our YouTube channel also has all of our videos we've done for, or not videos, but all of the podcasts we've done are all up on our YouTube channel as well. Also, uh, last season we watched, we did reaction kind of videos or discussion videos for every episode of Game of Thrones last year from, from, uh, fifth season. We did the same thing for, um, Hannibal. So if you're going to watch the third season of Hannibal, why not watch an episode and check out our impression and what we thought about it and, and hear us discuss it, then check out the next episode of Hannibal. And you can kind of watch it along with us in the past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do the same thing with the Game of Thrones videos. So, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can watch all of our videos. Just just watch, just binge watch, binge watch all of them in one sitting. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Screw Daredevil. Just binge watch TVE. Get, you know, so listen to so much of Will and I talking that you just get just sick of us talking. Yeah, exactly. You just, <laughs> you just want this website to not exist anymore that's, <laughs> that's our strategy that's if our... you want us to not exist anymore then we've done something right yes <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's it for tonight's podcast so everybody enjoy daredevil i'm going to myself i'm gonna run downstairs in about two hours start binging it myself uh yeah thank you everybody for listening tv enthusiast.com is the website weekly set is our show this was episode 48 next week's 49 week after that we're doing our 50th episode ed is joining us for that as well not just the daredevil uh thing on sunday but also on our 50th episode where we are going to be doing advocates of great television again if anybody's not heard that segment before this is a segment where we each pick a show and a specific episode of that show that we want to advocate that we want to say this is a really good show and this is why and we're going to present our pick and then we're going to all get together after having watched all of those episodes and talk about that and talk about, you know, what we thought of those episodes and kind of cue each other on, you know, 
quiz each other on on if we're interested in watching beyond this or not. Uh, we've done past ones where we talked about Black Mirror and Fargo and uh, what else have we done? The IT crowd. We've done a bunch of these. So this this will be another one for it. It's for our 50th podcast. So I hope everybody can join us in on that one. Uh, on the 49th podcast, we'll announce what we're watching. So if you want to watch along with us, you can do that. Um, but until then, thank you everybody for listening. Bye. Bye. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to the weekly set at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more content.